How about this problem? All right, we've got a uniform 30 kilogram slender rod. It starts from rest at the position shown. Determine its angular velocity after it has rotated four revolutions. And these forces, this 30 and 20, remain perpendicular to the rod. All right, good. a very important um, problem to understand and to, to look at. Choose conservation of energy. Right, potential plus kinetic plus non-conserved work equals potential plus kinetic. This is initial. Uh, this is final. Um, this could be gravity and spring, linear and rotational, F, D, M, theta. Right, gravity and spring, uh, linear and rotational. And I'm going to go ahead and write the whole thing, M, G, H. 1 half kx squared, 1 half mv squared, 1 half i omega squared, plus fd plus m theta equals all of that final, the mgh, plus 1 half kx squared, plus 1 half i omega squared, plus, what did I forget, I forgot the 1 half mv squared, um, 1 half mv squared. There we go. Okay, so th there's my long equation, but obviously there, there's no spring. Um, I didn't need to write the 1 half kx squared. Um, did it say it started from rest? Yep. All right, it starts from rest, so those are zero. Uh, are there any... Force times distances or moments times theta. I, yeah, I mean, I see some, those two big forces there, right, are pretty important. And there's a moment right here, a 20 newton meter moment. So, so yeah, I think I'm going to have some of those force times distance and moments times thetas. All right, this is the height of G, the velocity of G, the I of G. The height of G, velocity of G, the I of G, of the center of gravity now. G is not right here at point O. G is right there. This whole rod is, looks like, three meters long. And so this G is 0.5 from there. It's 1.5 from each of the ends of the rod. That's very important. Let's, let's visualize that. Okay, so let's start breaking this up into bite-sized pieces. Let's think about the MGH of that point G. So I, I think we can call this our zero height. Uh, and so initially it starts at a height of zero. And, and four revolutions, I mean, that's four complete revolutions. It, it came right back, oops, sorry. It came right back to that same spot. So the H and MGH is still zero. All right, so now let's tackle these forces times distances. We've got a 20 Newton force right here. What distance does it trap? Does it does it you know take place right? What for distance does it act? Well, let's kind of visualize this. This goes right here in a circle around point O, and it goes four times. So, so I would say that that distance would be four, you know, circumferences of the circle. So I, I might say, you know, circumferences is, is two pi r, and I'd say four of those uh, would be my distance. And yes, that, that would work. Um, but a lot of times these, this distance, if you've got a force that is remaining perpendicular to the rod, the distance that it acts is the arc length. What's the definition for arc length? S equals R theta. So, so the distance is equal to R theta. The theta is for revolutions, but that theta has to be in radians. For S equals R theta to work, that theta needs to be in radians. What is four revolutions in radians? You probably know, but if we want to convert revolutions to radians, I know one revolution is 2 pi. Uh, so 8 pi 
uh, is the theta that, the, that everything is going. Everything is going a theta of 8 pi. All right, so the FD for this 20 newton force would be 20 newtons times the distance would be r theta. The distance, and what is r? Sorry, what is r? r is not necessarily the radius of the, it's not half of the length of the uh, bar per se. Uh, r is the distance away from the center of rotation. So this 20 newton force is 1.5 away from the center of the theta that it goes is 8 pi. So that right there is my F, right, F times D right there. Uh, is that positive? Well, uh, my force is acting that direction, and the moment is that direction, that's that. It starts from rest. The, yeah, this one is moving that this direction, right? This is moving all clockwise. So, yes, I'd say that's positive FD because they're in the same direction. All right, how about that 30 Newton force? Its distance that it travels, it, it travels around point O. Be sure to visualize these correctly. Uh, and so its arc length or its distance that it travels is R theta, but its R is 0.5 times theta, right? So, and this also would be positive because that 30 newtons is always going in the same direction as the distance that it is covering. All right, so those are my FDs. That, that's kind of how you handle a force that's always acting perpendicular to something that is rotating like that. All right, let's do this M theta. Uh, the moment is 20 newton meters. The theta is 4 revolutions, but it has to be in radians. The theta is 8 pi. Is it positive? Yeah. Uh, it's clockwise, and uh, this theta is, is it's going clockwise. That's all we have on the left-hand side of our equation. On the right-hand side of our equation, we have 1 half m. Uh, what is m30? 1 half mvg squared. I'm not sure about vg, right? Here Here's point G right here. Um, I'll come back to that. Plus one-half I, the I of a slender rod, about point G of the slender rod, is one-twelfth ML, total L squared times omega squared. Be careful of those squares. Uh, make sure you square the one-half ML squared, but then there's also that omega squared out there. Here's my one equation. But I have two unknowns, VG and omega. Are they related? Is VG related to omega? Uh, yes, VG equals R. Omega R is not necessarily the radius or, or half of the, the um, bar. R is the distance that G is away from the center of rotation. Here, I don't have to use the instantaneous center or anything like that. I know that the center of rotation is at O. G is 0.5 away. So V. G is 0.5 omega, plug that in right there, then omega is my only unknown. Be careful here, 0.5 squared and omega squared, solve for omega squared, take the square root, I would get omega is 10.4 radians per second. I've got to visualize it, um, but I think you can visualize that it's going uh, clockwise. Now, uh, one, one thing that I, I want to just mention here, uh, what, if, what if you did all this math, what if you did this math and you got the fact that, or, or the math told you that omega squared is equal to, I don't know, negative 70, negative something. This, this, this is not the, the numbers that you would have gotten for this problem, but what if you what if it said omega squared, and we've talked about this for particles, omega squared is equal to negative, and, and so, so then what does that mean? You, you can't take the square root of a negative. This would be, this would not give you any, any result. This would be impossible. What would that tell you? That would tell you that it never makes it to the point that you thought it made it to. So if it said find the omega after four revolutions, well... Maybe it couldn't go four revolutions. Maybe it went two and a half and then it started spinning backwards or something like that. Um, if you get an omega squared is equal to a negative number, then either 
it's impossible, right? I mean, it is impossible. So either it never makes it to what, where you thought it was going to make it to, or you, or you just did a, a mistake in the math. You should definitely go back and double check your math to make sure um, that you did that right. But, you know, if, if you get it, uh, omega squared is negative. That is impossible. That's not true. It never makes it to that um, point that you thought it would. Uh, but anyway, this is just a, just a hypothetical. We didn't have this in this problem. We got an omega of 10.4 radians per second.